It's two days before art student Caitlin Markham's 22nd birthday, but sadly, she will never celebrate it. Careful, 911, where's your emergency? Hi, my name is John Carter. I know that you're not supposed to report a missing person after before 24 hours, but my fiance is missing. I, I can't find her anywhere. Okay, where did you see her last? I saw her at like 12 o'clock last night. It's been 18 hours since John Carter says he last saw his fiance, Caitlin Markham, alive. Panicked, John calls his future father-in-law, David Markham. He immediately screamed into the phone, Caitlin's missing. David races to his daughter's place, and he's met there by Detective Rebecca Irvin. When we got to Caitlin's condo, um, there's no signs of forced entry. Um, into the townhome. We check the doors, check the windows, check everywhere. There's nothing that's jumping out. There's no signs of a struggle. Inside Caitlin's bedroom, investigators from the Fairfield Police Department discover Caitlin's purse and car keys laying in the center of her bed. Also in the bedroom is her dog, Murphy. The dog had been locked in her bedroom, which she's not usually locked in the bedroom, and he had gone to the bathroom in there. Her purse and her keys were smack dab in the middle of her bed. If I'm going to bed, I don't put something right in the middle of it. Nothing seemed to make any sense at, at all. Fairfield police agree. Something's not right here. Um, and again, based on what her friends and family were telling us, this isn't normal for this girl. Fairfield police speculate about the possibility of Caitlin running away. No, not, not Caitlin. She was graduating in three weeks. Graduating from art school, engaged, and getting ready to move to Colorado with her fiance. And this was not for her not to call anybody, for her not to do anything. I, I felt something was wrong, very, very wrong. So where is Caitlin? Her fiance, John Carter, who was the last known person to see her alive, breaks down his final moments with Caitlin to detectives. They had had another friend over at the apartment earlier, um, and then he had left, and then John had left and gone to a party um, at that point. Everything that we had initially, there was no fighting. Guess that depends on who you ask. Caitlin's best friend, Michelle, claims that just two days before Caitlin went missing, the couple had been fighting about money, and the heated disagreement came to a head at a church festival. I saw her on uh, the Friday night at the Sacred Heart Festival. It's the last time that I saw her and talked to her. He, I guess, had bought raffle tickets, like $100 in raffle tickets, and she was mad about it, like she was pissed off. In fact, so upset, Michelle says Caitlin left the festival early. I feel like they would fight about it just behind closed doors because they didn't like to, like, like in the group, like they didn't want to be arguing about it in front of everybody. And whatever is kept behind closed doors is anybody's guess. But one thing's for sure. Two days later, Caitlin was gone. Yeah, I mean, it's completely like she was my best friend. Like, I haven't had many girlfriends ever. She was really my only friend. And her being gone has completely shattered my whole world. 20 heartbreaking months pass. Then, a break in the case. A husband and wife that were looking for metal to recycle along Big Cedar Road in Franklin County, Indiana. While they were searching for the metals, they uh, they located some human bones. And I was called to investigate the remains. 25 miles away in Indiana, skeletal remains are found covered with trash in an area known for dumping. Crime scene investigators brush away debris to reveal several bones, including a skull and jawbone. When we were looking at the skull, we noticed a, a tooth that was protruding, uh, pretty identifiable. And so one of the county uh, sheriff's deputies, he, uh, he got on his phone and started looking for anybody that was missing. In a serendipitous moment, Caitlin Markham's photo is the first to pop up. When we looked at the picture of, of her missing report, we could almost identify her directly from her, from her teeth. The local forensic anthropologist will positively ID the remains as belonging to Caitlin Markham. And a couple of days later, I get a knock on the door from the pastor and the, and the detective, and 
Um, I knew what they were there to tell me. But how in the world did Caitlin end up dead in a trash heap in Indiana? Residents in the small town of Fairfield, Ohio, are desperate for answers. When an anonymous donor with no connection to the case, who has a keen interest in finding justice in unsolved mysteries, makes a huge donation. That money brings in private investigator J. Ryan Green. He's an individual that wanted to do something nice for somebody before he died, is what he told me. Felt Caitlin needed uh, an outside investigator to come in and take a fresh look at the case. A fresh look that starts with a fresh listen to the 911 call made by John Carter on the night he reported his fiance missing. John misrepresented the truth in a 911 call uh, with his own statements. Beautiful 21-year-old Caitlin Markham's body is in a heap, tossed in a dumping ground found in a remote part of Indiana. But how she got there is still a mystery. Now, an anonymous donor who is not connected to the case but claims to have a keen interest in finding justice has reportedly put up big money to help find her killer. Private investigator J. Ryan Green jumps on the case. Green goes back to the beginning, the 911 call made by Caitlin's fiance, John Carter, on the night she went missing. The car is still there. The purse is still Okay, and you're out there now? I'm heading out there now. I, I like, had been trying to get a hold of her, and I decided to go by her house to see if she was okay, and her car was still there, which is why I'm like really freaking out. John has just told the 911 operator that Caitlin's car and purse are at her home. Yet when the 911 operator asks if he's there, he says he's on his way. Green wonders, how would Carter know about her car and purse if he wasn't even there yet? John misrepresented the truth in the 911 call. Yeah, with his own statements. Adding to Green's suspicion, he says in police interviews, John claimed he went by Caitlin's house first, ran an errand, and then called 911. Green asks, who does that? Then he calls this portion of John's 911 call into question. OK, and you guys didn't have an argument or anything? Not at all. Not at all? Caitlin's best friend, Michelle, tells quite a different story. I knew that they were fighting. Um, and when he was like on the 911 tape, when he was saying that it, that they hadn't been arguing at all, I'm just like, why would you lie about that part of it? When the dispatcher asked John if Caitlin and him had been fighting, he said, no, not at all. You're telling a dispatcher that you weren't in a fight and you were in a fight. The Markham family attorney also listened to the 911 call. I was a, uh, a firefighter and a paramedic before I was a lawyer, and um, I, I have heard my share of 911 calls. I've made 911 calls, and a 911 call is usually a call for help. That's what it is, call for help. John Carter's call was a call to inform. Inform? Inform what and to whom? The 911 call continues. And the Sacred Heart Festival is going on right up the street, and there's a lot of questionable people there. He immediately offered up a theory. You noticed an hour ago that your girlfriend isn't where she's supposed to be, and the Carnies took her? I mean, that's a leap. Police say no one has been ruled out in this case as a person of interest. Caitlin's fiance took a voice stress analysis test, and that was reportedly inconclusive. He also took two polygraphs, and authorities are not releasing those results. But private investigator Green believes where Caitlin's body was found is a huge piece of the puzzle. This was an illegal dump site where she was found. So somebody knew about the dump site and somebody just tossed her here like a piece of trash. Somebody? It troubles me a lot to know that, you know, the Carter family uh, has property in this area. That's right. This spot is just minutes away from John Carter's family home. Coincidence? Green doesn't think so. This road is in close proximity to where John Carter would have traveled to go to his uh, family's property. 
Police investigators believe Caitlin died in Ohio and her body was dumped here in Indiana. Green thinks the killer needed some help moving the body and has a theory. There was a friend at Caitlin's apartment besides John Carter the last night she was seen. That friend left a little earlier than John did, uh, supposedly. That's right. The night Caitlin went missing, the couple was not alone. Fairfield police say they had company. A detective tells us it was a longtime childhood friend of John's named Brad Von Bargen. Now, he drove a car that he referred to as his baby. Um, and I found out that he no longer had his baby. He sold it in 2013, just after Caitlin was found. He sold it, sold it in a rush and said that he needed to leave to go to North Carolina. The PI set out to find it. This car, the 1997 Green Acura that Green says Brad was driving the night he left Caitlin's home. I tracked it down. And he's revealing this all new evidence only to Crime Watch Daily. I had it sent to police as a crime scene. They did a luminol test. There was evidence of, of blood in, in, in the trunk area. Yes, blood in the trunk of the car, once owned by the man Green believes was the second to last known person to ever see Caitlin Markham alive. Unfortunately, this potential break in the case may have come too late. I obtained a vehicle almost four years later. You have extreme cold in, in Cincinnati and you have hot weather um, with the cleaning of the vehicle, shampooing, um, that messes with DNA, that messes with blood. Despite what the private investigator thinks, the Fairfield Police Department tells Crime Watch Daily it does not believe Brad was involved. But Detective Irvin says she can't officially clear anyone because this is an ongoing investigation. Green is still frustrated the car wasn't tested at the time of Caitlin's disappearance. The members of the police department um, are, are aware of the family's criticism. But I think every agency that has looked at this case and has reviewed it with us uh, uh, demonstrate that we have done everything that modern police investigative techniques require. Was that the vehicle that Caitlin Markham was transported in? We'll never know. But the determined PI is not giving up. And he gets his hands on another piece of vital evidence. It's never been released to the public until now cell phone records from the night Caitlin went missing. I got an insight to this case that no one else would have because that's my job. I'm a private investigator, that's what I do. Investigator Green claims this cell phone timeline contradicts previous statements John made to police. In recent months, John hasn't been talking to authorities, but he agrees to meet with private investigator Green. And only Crime Watch Daily has hidden cameras set up and ready to roll. John and his mother Karen joined Investigator Green and his associate for the interview. Hey John, how are you? Doing good, how are you Ryan? Good, been a while, been a while. Investigator Green introduces a timeline comparing cell phone records and John's earlier interviews to authorities concerning the night Caitlin went missing. First up, Investigator Green questions a text. In John's interview with police, he claims he sent a good morning text to Caitlin on the day she went missing. But according to cell phone records obtained by Investigator Green, he did not. I do believe that I had sent her a message before I went to bed. Mm -hmm. um, but according to the Fairfield police, or according to my phone records, I didn't send her anything, but I, I could have swore that I had sent her a message I have before. those, yeah, you did. there isn't anything. But John's mother is quick to point out that the 911 call that John made is also missing from the cell phone record. That's a call we know he made. Mm -hmm. Nobody's questioning that, and yet it doesn't show up. Okay. How can we say that just because something else isn't showing up, mm -hmm. that there wasn't something else? Next, investigator Green brings up the phone call John made to his friend Matt on the night Caitlin disappeared. According to statements John made to police, he was on the phone with Matt when he was driving up to Caitlin's townhome and discovered her car in the driveway and became concerned. Stop signs here, you turn the corner, you go up into the drive mm -hmm. and you park 
you walk across. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you remember it? Mm -hmm. Okay. But, and this is a huge but, according to Investigator Green, as noted in the cell phone records, John hangs up with his friend Matt, and 38 seconds later, he calls Caitlin's dad, screaming that Caitlin is missing. You called David Markham 38 seconds after you hung up with Matt. You wouldn't have even had time to go in the house for 38 seconds. If you're in the parking lot, you wouldn't have had a chance to even go into Caitlin's room in 38 seconds. He didn't have time to get in the front door, much less even go to her room to see if she was there. That's 38 seconds to park, walk across the street, enter her condo, look around, and then declare to her father that Caitlin is missing. Again, I don't remember the exact order of when I called people. But the exact order in which he called people is in black and white on the cell phone record. And it suggests... In my investigative opinion, that he knew she was gone prior to him going into the, to the house. But whether John Carter has a poor memory or a guilty conscience, only time will tell. P.I. Green thinks he's on to something, though, and while he says the anonymous donor is no longer paying him, he plans to stay on the case for Caitlin's sake. They need peace, and the only way they're gonna get peace is if this case is solved. And while Caitlin's dad certainly has his theories on what happened to his daughter, he says the most important thing is that anyone with hard facts about Caitlin's murder needs to call the Fairfield Police. That number is 513-829-8201.